Hi guys, so welcome to the second half of chapter nine, Microbial Control. I'm going to narrate the rest of the slides for you today um, so that you can have this for referring to as you study the rest of chapter nine. Um, you should have already watched the beginning of the chapter, which was narrated by Professor Selk. And a lot of that was the vocabulary describing the different terms that we use when we're talking about microbial control, especially in um, the case of medical environments. So please make sure that you watch that and refer to that in terms of the um, vocabulary. All right, so this should be the next slide after the uh, the final one that she used in her narration, which was the overview of the chapter. So this is an introduction into the physical means that we use to um, control microbial growth in our environment. And so there are the first thing to understand is that microbes have different levels of resistance to physical means of control. And what that means is some, we've been talking about this all semester, but some of the microbes are hardier than others, right? We talk about endospores being very hardy and um, mycoplasma species uh, having that waxy mycolic um, acid in the cell wall and that helps them to resist some of these uh, control mechanisms. So as you can see here on this slide, we, when we talk about heat or radiation or using sterilizing gas, um, you can see the difference between two of those groups, which is the endospores and the vegetative cells. Um, and you can see that the endospores here show much more resistance to all of these methods of control. So you can see that they need to be heated to 120 degrees Celsius versus 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and in that, in that comparison, as far as heat uh, at, at what, for whatever set amount of time this was measured, uh, you can see the relative resistance is one and a half times for endospores versus uh, vegetative cells. And so you can read this slide and see that that's what they're showing you here. When we're talking about microbial control, we're really talking about how much cell death or um, how much cell death are we causing or how much growth are we stopping? Um, and so this is just one chart, which is sort of a rep representative chart of what you might see if you were comparing different methods of microbial control in terms of cell death, you might see that, for instance, um, you know, this bacitracin ointment is measured as having a, uh, a greater cell death um, versus this triple antibiotic ointment out here in the green. Um, so what you have over here is your percentage on the left, your percentage of surviving bacteria, and you can see that those curves are measured by the slopes of the lines and measured over time, uh, which ones, you know, that Terracil wound care antiseptic ointment is working the fastest, right? It's getting that, that cell death um, number down faster. When we're talking about cell death, what's really going on inside the cells? Uh, we come back to this at the very end of the presentation, but in general, a lot of what we're talking about is disruption of the cell membrane. Uh, you may have heard the term surfactant when we talk about detergents, whether it's hand soap or um, laundry detergent or just a, an environmental sort of over all purpose cleaner. A lot of times you'll hear the word surfactant. And what that means is it's a substance um, that releases the surface tension between molecules. And so it sort of breaks them apart and sort of makes holes in the cell membranes. And you can see that happening here. So for our purposes in terms of, in terms of talking about microbial control, we're talking about disruption of the bacterial cell membrane. Um, surfactants are also used in other parts of life. This is how dyes are created. Uh, they're, they're termed surfactants because they're permeating the, the dye molecule into whatever fabric or, you know, substance they're dyeing, right? So it's the same idea. We measure 
uh, microbial control effect uh, in terms of D value sometimes. So what we're looking at here is surviving cells on the left um, against time uh, on the bottom axis. And when we're talking about D value, it's the time uh, or dose that it takes at a certain condition, whether that's temperature or pressure, um, to achieve a log reduction of cells. So that means you're killing one log or 90% of the bacterial cells in your sample uh, or microbial organisms, whatever, whatever it is that you're measuring. But a D value is a reduction of 90% of those microbes given a specific uh, set condition, okay? And so here, if you look at this microbial death rate, you can see the way that you would, you um, figure out what your D rate is, is to plot your numbers of bacterial cells over time in your condition. So you're going to take samples at minute one through minute you know 10 and measure the uh, live cells in the sample at that time and plot the numbers. And when you do that, and then you create your, your slope, um, you can determine from which point to which point are you losing 90% of your uh, microbial cells. Obviously, if it's a straight line, that should be sort of a continuous relationship. And you'll see in this example, you've got between minute two and three is measured, between minute five and six is measured, and each time uh, they're losing one log of living microbes. So the D value for this example would be one minute. And this is sort of a theoretical experiment. Uh, you can see here, if you start out with 10 to the 6 microbes and you want to get down to 10 to the 0 or 10 to the you know 1 where you have one microorganism left, um, and here's your log of survivors, what you're looking for is that decrease in log number, right? So you're going from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 1 or uh, five logs to zero logs, assuming uh, that you had one minute uh, per D value, then you're looking at six minutes, right? So you're starting at 10 to the sixth, and over six minutes time, you're getting down to 10 to the one. So that's just an example of how those calculations are used example, we said we were starting with 10 to the 12 endospores. That won't if you start with less uh, microbes that you're trying to destroy, it will take you less time um, or less heat, or you might be able to vary your conditions. Um, but obviously, it depends on how much of a microbial count you have at the beginning. Genetic variability. You might have a mixed population. You might have some vegetative cells and some endospores. You may have some uh, bacterial species that are um, more heat resistant than others. And so the genetic variability in your origin population is going to determine also um, how, how stringent of a control method you need to use. Obviously, the most susceptible cells are killed first. The temperature and the pH of your environment, uh, how much you're able to control those things. The higher the temperature and the lower the pH generally have a increased microbial control effect. Concentration or dosage of an agent. Uh, obviously, when you're talking about chemical means of control, the higher the concentration in general, uh, the higher the control factor will be. And the mode of action of the agent. How is it working? Is it breaking down the cell walls? Does it have to get into the nucleic acid like radiation? Um, does it need a certain amount of contact time in order to do the work that it, it does in order to control? And here are some figures uh, just sort of demonstrating those ideas. Up here in the upper left, you have the log number of viable cells. This is talking about the difference between your origin uh, microbial count. So up here you have on the upper right, um, those two go together. You sort of have, if you start out with a high load of microbes at 10 to the 9 versus a lower load of microbes at 10 to the negative 1, um, you'll see here that the time for sterilization 
changes, right? The, the more microbes you have to start with, the, the longer you need to, to do your method in order to make sure that you have um, completed the control that you're trying to complete. Here we talk about um, in the bottom left, in case you can't see my pointer, um, they're, they're looking at the comparison between types of cells. So you have the vegetative cells that are having a much more steep death curve line, right? So they die much quicker under any method of control than spores do. <clears throat> it can be very difficult to get spores down to the negative line at all. Um, and then here, the time, the dose of agent, um, when your agent is added, and the amount of activity that it can have. Here you have uh, on the lower left graph, you have at 10 to the nine, your microbes are growing consistently, then your agent is added and that death curve drops down in a very steep curve. It really depends on what your agent is. Um, and remember that this is measuring cell death. If we're talking about a microbiostatic agent, then you have the dotted line, which means that your microbes are still existing, they're just not allowed to grow or reproduce. So what are the antimicrobial agents doing in order to kill the cells? Uh, we talked a little bit about how they can damage the cell wall, right? You have those surfactant molecules that can make holes in the membrane and lyse the cells. Um, they can alter membrane permeability and just uh, cause complete chaos in the um, equilibrium between the inside of the cell and the external environment. And that will sort of kill the cell just by having the cell be completely um, non-functional. You can also um, interrupt cellular metabolism and reproduction. Some of these agents act on internal membrane proteins or internal cell proteins. And so if they're targeting nucleic acids or structures like enzymes, like nucleases or um, the DNA polymerases that we've been talking about, if those pro proteins are affected, obviously the essential cellular um, met metabolic processes are not able to happen. And so um, they can kill the cells that way. So how do you choose your agent? There are a lot of them out there. And what are the things that you need to consider? The first thing is, what is the site that you're treating? Um, there are different microbial agents, uh, microbial control agents for the body versus for the environment. Um, are you looking at medical instruments that are external, something that's you know, kept clean in the operating room versus something that's actually a medical instrument used in the surgery that has to penetrate um, the inside of the body? Are you looking for items that are only in contact with the skin? Uh, what's your relative susceptibility of the microbe that you're concerned about? Um, again, we saw the differences in some of those uh, resistance levels. And what are the environmental conditions? Is there a lot of organic ma uh, material in the sample? Is there a biofilm? Can the item be cleaned first? Here's where we talk about scrubbing your hands or scrubbing your instruments. Can you reduce the amount of microbes without a treatment simply by um, the reduction of that organic material? And again, I said before, but higher temperatures and lower pH tend to enhance the germicidal effects. So here's where you're washing your hands with warm water or your dishes with hot water, um, because that actually makes a significant difference when we're talking about microbial control. Um, effectiveness of germicides. You can have high level, intermediate, and low level germicides, and you can see um, some of the information on these in your Pearson chapter. This is a um, figure that is a chart sort of showing you the relative resistance of microbes. Here you have prions at the top. Um, we talked about how resistant these proteins are. Um, very often, they are not even um, 
they're not even broken down in the autoclave. They need to be incinerated or, um, you know, broken up with um, high, high, high heat, like flame. Um, then you have your bacterial endospores. I keep telling you these guys are hardy, right? They are difficult to kill. They're right up there at the top. Some protozoan species form uh, cysts, um, and both multiple species are listed here in sort of the number five, but also at the number three, specifically this cryptosporidium species has a very stable cyst. Um, so those can be very difficult to break down. They're extremely stable in the environment. And that makes sense because protozoa are single-celled species that live in the environment sort of on their own without much protection, right? They're not living inside bodies or inside hosts. They're living just in their environment on their own. Then you have your mycobacteria. This is your waxy mycolic acid cell wall, remember? So that does make it um, more resistant to our microbial control methods. And then you have small non-enveloped non viruses. Um, this is sort of your uh, foot and mouth disease viruses like, like the one that I work with at Plum Island. Um, these are what we call naked viruses. They are resistant um, because without the um, cell membrane, it's Sorry, doing some damage control over here. Okay, so for the small non-envelope viruses, uh, those viruses are naked viruses and they don't have that envelope which makes them less prone to being broken down by um, our microbial control agents. Then you have your protozoa, your fungal spores, your gram-negative bacteria, uh, vegetative fungi, large non-enveloped viruses, most gram-positive bacteria. So you'll notice here that your gram-negative is more resistant than your gram-positive most of the time. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because the gram-positive, though they have that peptidoglycan, we've seen that there are a lot of agents that can um, take apart the bonds that are, that are formed between those NAG and NAM molecules of the peptidoglycan. And so those bacteria are actually pretty easy to break down. And then finally, your enveloped viruses. And the reason that I bring this up is just because we're all experiencing um, crazy pandemic right now from COVID-19. COVID-19 is an enveloped virus, which means that it has a cellular envelope um, existing around the nucleocapsid, which is why uh, we stress our uh, public right now to wash their hands. Um, these viruses are not extremely hardy. They're actually really easy to be broken down um, with a basic <clears throat> detergent, soap and water uh, de-germing action. Um, they're not a super bug. It's just a highly contagious bug. And so there's a lot of it going around. It is easily infectious, but it's not difficult to break down. Okay, so additional concerns for microbial control include the questions. Is sterilization required? Sometimes you don't need things to be 100% sterile. Sometimes getting the microbial count low enough so that um, the number of microbes on whatever surface that is is not considered to be pathogenic or infectious or a problem is enough. Uh, is the item to be reused? Can the item withstand heat, pressure, radiation, or chemicals? You know, sometimes things like clothes or plastics or, you know, certain materials really don't withstand heat well um, or some of these other methods. And so that's a consideration. Will the agent penetrate to the necessary extent? So what, this is when we're talking about things that are um, structures that have insides, things like mattresses or um, you know pieces of equipment that are used inside laboratories that are like boxes with, with working parts inside. Um, you can sterilize the outside of it or disinfect the outside of that, but 
is it enough to not um, get into the inside? Things like that. Is the method or uh, is the method cost and labor efficient and is it safe? So some of these, uh, this, per this question pertains a lot to the more gaseous methods of control where we're using ozone or um, certain ethylene oxides to uh, use the gases to penetrate certain uh, materials. Some of those gases are toxic or explosive, and we really need to be sure that when we're using those, um, A, it's a warranted cost and, you know, um, labor, the, that the labor cost is worthwhile, and B, that we're able to get rid of the residual chemicals that may be present from those methods um, before they're put in use in the, in the public so biosafety levels, we've talked about this a lot. In general, we talk about it as a, um, a way to think about the infectiousness of the agents that you're working with. So things that are more infectious to humans, things like hantavirus or Ebola virus or anthrax toxin or anthrax bacteria, sorry. Um, these are used in BSL-4 level labs because they have the highest protection. Um, but the other thing to think about is agents that not necessarily are the most infectious, but are the most difficult to control. So here's where you get your prions. You know, prions that infect humans are pretty rare, but because the control for them is so difficult, um, they are allotted to that BSL-4 group of, group of microbes that um, can only be handled at that level. Uh, the things that are affected, obviously, in your BSL levels are the PPE requirements, the design of the lab, the airflow, those things um, change as you go up in BSL levels. <coughs> Here's an example of a BSL-4 laboratory. You can see a full suit with no, um, no cracks in it no openings of any kind and you can see that yellow hose <clears throat> is the oxygen line those oxygen lines come down from the ceiling you can attach or detach to them depending on what part of the laboratory you're in and none of this equipment can come off while you're inside the lab you go through a decon area uh, remove the outer layer go through another decon area remove the inner layer and then you're able to exit All right, control by physical agents. So what are we talking about physical? Um, we're talking about heat uh, that can be in the presence or absence of water. We're talking about temperature, um, desiccation, which is when we are removing any uh, moisture or water from the samples. Um, so desiccation and lyophilization are, are similar in that way. Osmotic conditions. We can use uh, hypertonic solutions to control the growth of agents, right? Because we can actually um, create high salt or high sugar environments, and that will cause the cells to become inactive. Filtration is a physical means of removal, so you're actually passing your substance through a filter and catching all of those microbes in the process. And then radiation. Here is your uh, all-knowing, uh, all-inclusive figure that will tell you the various things you need to know about all of these physical methods. You can see here the methods are listed on the left. The conditions of those methods are listed in the second column. The action that they take, and you see here a lot of under the actions, what you'll see is denatures proteins and destroys membranes, right? That's very common. Denatures proteins and destroys membranes. Um, in some cases, like under refrigeration or freezing, you see inhibits metabolism. So this is not actually lysing the cell. It's not doing anything to the cell structure. What it is doing is cooling it down, uh, causing the cell to go sort of dormant and just not metabolize, right? So it's able to just sort of hang out there. Um, some organisms die under these condition, conditions, but some organisms don't. They just sort of stop reproducing. And then if they were brought back up to temperature, they resume normal action. Um, 
And then you can see down here under radiation, you have destroys DNA. This is specific to radiation. It actually goes into the cell, through the cell membrane, and is able to break the bonds between the nucleic acids. And um, so changes the DNA or completely destroys the DNA so that that replication in that organism can't happen. Similar chart here, you guys can review this. And we're gonna start with heat. So <clears throat> what's the effect of heat on cellular structures? Well, remember, heat breaks bonds, right? So obviously it's gonna change the structure of proteins. It's gonna alter that tertiary structure by breaking some of those easier to break bonds and then changing the actual physical formation of the protein so it's inactive. Uh, it can destroy the cytoplasmic membranes that way and again, break the bonds between nucleic acids so that those your DNA has uh, nicks and cuts where it shouldn't and isn't uh, complete anymore. Do we need to worry about killing hyperthermophilic prokaryotes or microbes? Um, no, we don't, right? Because they don't live in our normal environment. Um, so we can use heat uh, confidently because we know that in general, um, our environment has a certain temperature range. And if we exceed that, then we should be able to control the microbes that live at those higher temperatures. Uh, when we're talking about measuring the death of microbes, we talk about two different things. One is the thermal death time, which is TDT. This is the shortest length of time required to kill all microbes in a specific volume at a specific temperature. And then we have thermal death point, which is the lowest temperature required to kill all microbes in a sample in 10 minutes. So you have two different things here. You have what's the shortest amount of time I need to, I need to heat something uh, in order to kill all, all the microbes in, in that sample at that temperature. And then what's the lowest temperature I need to use in order to kill all the microbes in 10 minutes? So sort of similar related questions here. You can use moist heat. If you're using heat, uh, water is an excellent conductor of heat, so it's a little bit more efficient if there's water present, like in a steam situation. This is what we're using when we autoclave. We have moist heat and it's also under pressure. So we add that pressurized effect, um, which is also shortens the amount of time that we need to submit the, um, the things that we're sterilizing to. Um, here you see protein denaturation, cell membrane disruption, as we talked about. Uh, this is what we're using to sterilize laboratory media, glassware, hospital instruments. All right, this is sort of, it falls under your autoclave um, designation, except remember that autoclaves also add pressure. And it has some non-sterile applications as well. You can use moist heat. Um, just to lower the bacterial count. So here's where you have your heat preserved canned foods, your pasteurized foods, and um, sanitizing things like public utensils in restaurants, uh, dishwasher, you know, high heat dishwashers in restaurants, those kinds of things. Um, the approximate conditions for moist heat killing, you can see here yeasts and molds, um, or are pretty susceptible. Uh, molds actually say 30 minutes at 62, which is a little bit higher. Um, bacteria, 10 minutes at 60 to 70. Bacteria, it depends on which ones, right? It depends on, they're talking about here, mesophilic bacteria, and they're also talking about the vegetative cells here. Uh, viruses, a little bit more, 30 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius. And then once you get to spores, um, these are gonna go up. Uh, two to over 800 minutes. So here you have that, you know, ex excessive amount of time at a really high temperature. So types of moist heat, we're talking about boiling. Uh, this is 100 degrees plus or minus, depending on if you're boiling water or some other liquid. Um, five to 10 minutes to kill vegetative forms, 30 minutes for... 
most viruses or certain kinds of viruses. Um, if you needed to use boiling to inactivate your bacterial endospores, though we would not recommend it, you would need to do that for 20 or more hours. Um, this is also a method for sanitation. Again, sanitation refers to the public health uh, sphere, right, that we're talking about the general public. And yes, sanitation is, uh, we're talking about boiling your utensils um, and anything else that sort of might fall under that condition. Autoclaving is a moist heat with added pressure. Um, the steam does have to con come into contact with the object, so it can't, you can't autoclave something, you know, inside of a sealed box. It has to have air openings so that the steam can, um, can reach it. And this is a method of sterilization for hospitals and medical uh, personnel. Here's an example of what an autoclave looks like inside. You have your autoclavable things here, the steam comes in, it's fed through um, a water, you know, a water feed somewhere in your laboratory or in your hospital. And um, the door is a gasketed, um, very strong, usually, you know, some kind of heavy metal door. You're cranking it shut to make sure that the pressure stays in. There's a pressure gauge, a safety valve, um, but you can see that this chamber is able to be heated and pressurized at the same time. This is sort of what they look like if you're in a laboratory, you have these larger uh, units, but actually just this middle box here is really the autoclave chamber. It goes straight back like you can see here on the right side. So pasteurization, we've talked about Louis Pasteur, the father of microbiology, and that he uh, sort of invented pasteurization. Um, this is when heat is applied to kill pathogenic microbes without destroying the food or flavor <clears throat> or value. Um, remember that we talked about wine makers, uh, how they were able to benefit from this practice, but also um, it, it has grown in usage. So now we're able to use it for many of our uh, foods and shelved foods so that we can lower our microbial count to the point where um, we can keep things on a shelf stable for extended amounts of time. Does not kill endospores or many non-pathogenic microbes. Um, it does slow down food spoilage in the refrigerator. What this means is it's not, remember it's not sterile. Um, there are some microbes there. It is a static sort of approach. So if you were to buy milk and put it, that has been pasteurized, put it into your refrigerator, the microbes are still there, they're reproducing, but at a much lower rate. And if you were to take that milk out and leave it on your counter for a few hours, you would notice that those microbes have now picked up and ramped up their um, metabolism and are now dividing rapidly and your milk is going to spoil uh, within the day probably because, because you've removed it from that situation. There are different methods of pasteurization. You can have sort of regular pasteurization, then there's a flash method where a high temperature for a short time is used, and then there's ultra high temperature, um, which is also used under certain conditions. So you can see here the differences in the treatments. <clears throat> um, and some of the usages for this ultra high or high pasteurization, um, milk versus organic milk or boxed milk, right? Boxed milk is ultra pasteurized because it's at room temperature sitting on the shelf for a longer time. Uh, juice boxes, packets of creamers in restaurants, those are ultra high um, or at least high, if not ultra high. Um, flash pasteurization is also used in fruit and vegetable juices, uh, beer and wine um, and other, other dairy products as well. When we're talking about dry heat, that's just heat, no water, um, <clears throat> we're talking about denaturing the proteins uh, the same way that we are with other forms of heat control. But you're needing, you're needing to use higher temperatures than with moist heat because you don't have that water to conduct the heat throughout the sample. So your temperature has to be higher. Um, 
There are hot air sterilization techniques, dry ovens. These are really hot for a very long amount of time. And also incineration. Um, this is a method used for medical waste, uh, animal carcasses, infected uh, materials of any sort that um, can't just be autoclaved. So, and, and our back to incinerator, right? That, that's a dry heat situation. Um, this is what they were needing to, to use in the case of prions or materials. <clears throat> All right, now let's get away from the heat idea. We've talked a little bit about pasteurization, so that's the actual heating of the product in order to get it to the shelf, and then once you take it home, you put it in the refrigerator. So what you're doing when you put it in the refrigerator is you're using low temperature to heat, to, um, to decrease the metabolism of those organisms. So the growth curve is uh, static, it is not happening, um, and the reproduction is much slower. Except for what group of microorganisms? Remember, there are some of those organisms that actually enjoy low temperatures, right? And one of those is uh, Listeria. This is the bacterial species that we see in uh, deli meats and other uh, foods where it's able to uh, reproduce well in that refrigerated temperature of zero degrees to seven degrees. Um, but that's an exception. Most organisms would not be replicating. And in general, um, most microorganisms, you know, there will be static in those refrigerated conditions. And that's why we're using that for our food storage. So remember, those are those psychrophilic organisms that are able to um, replicate at very low temperatures. If we're talking about freezing below zero degrees Celsius, um, not many microbes can reproduce at this temperature, but many can survive freezing. Uh, what this means is you are slowing any metabolic actions down in the cell, just like in uh, refrigeration, but even more so. And you have this slow freezing that forms ice crystals, which sometimes can puncture the cell membrane. And obviously, if that happens, then the microorganism is not able to survive. But if you have a quick freezing uh, situation, this eliminates the ice crystal formation. And so then you do have uh, microbes that are able to recover when they're brought back up to a higher temperature. We also use this quick freezing uh, for our fruits and vegetables. Um, that's how we are able to stabilize the cell membranes of the fruits and vegetables, like strawberries or you know uh, string beans when we buy them so that they're not completely liquidy and mush when we thaw them back out they still have some structure and that's because we kept that ice crystal uh, formation from happening by doing a quick freeze we use this also when we're preparing viable bacterial cultures uh, to be shipped to other labs or, or for whatever reason um, if we need to grow a certain bacteria in large amounts and then ship it very often a quick freeze process is done to prepare that bacteria so that when, um, when they reach their destination point, they can just be brought up to temperature and they'll still be viable cells. Desiccation is the removal of water. Uh, we talked about how most bacteria can grow almost anywhere as long as there is water present. So removal of that water means that you're uh, actively um, taking away one of the, one of the things that bacteria need in order to grow. It does lead to metabolic inhibition. Uh, it's often a static and not a cytal sort of action, which means you're not killing the cells. It's the same as the um, previous slide. You can remove the water and then, you know, if these cells are brought into a situation where the water is returned, they resume their a normal metabolic activity and they're able to divide again. Um, endospores can be centuries old. Uh, tuberculosis bacterium can survive for months without water. <laughs>
But again, this is specific to species, right? Not all bacteria are the same. Some are more resistant to certain conditions than others. And here you have just an interesting slide showing you the desiccation methods uh, for apricots uh, when they're being harvested in Pakistan. Pretty neat. All right, lyophilization. Lyophilization is similar to desiccation in the sense that you're removing water, uh, but you're actually doing it in a much faster and more aggressive manner. You are sort of freeze drying uh, the cells. And so they're instantly frozen in liquid nitrogen. Uh, the vacuum removes any water from the sample. And so you don't have ice crystals forming. Um, again, when we're purchasing bacteria, this is often the way that they are shipped to us. Um, sometimes desiccated, sometimes lyophilized. Finally, you have filtration. Filtration is an actual physical removal method, right? You're passing your sample through a filter or screen-like material where you have pores that are small enough to retain uh, the cells or viral particles. And you can imagine that's really small. Um, these are used to uh, sterilize heat-sensitive materials. So things like vaccines and antibiotics where we can't use heat to kill the bacteria because it would also uh, denature the proteins inside the product that we're trying to preserve. Um, we need to use some other method. So we're passing those kinds of uh, products through a filter, catching any contaminating bacteria in that filter, and then uh, they're able to be sterilized. Uh, also, we can sterilize air in this way. So this is where you get your HEPA filters um, or your respiratory masks like we've been seeing a lot. In the and these are just some visuals sort of showing you how that works. Uh, these pores are, you know, sometimes very, very tiny. Osmotic pressure. Um, here we have high concentration of salts or sugars in foods. Uh, we see this, remember, years ago before we had refrigeration, meant much meat or other food products were salted or cured uh, in, a, in an effort to preserve them, and they would put them out in the cold to keep their meats a lot, you know, meats viable throughout the winter. Um, but they would often salt them in this huge, you know, sort of salt casing for a long time, or sugar casings, depending on depending on what it was, and that just prevented bacteria from uh, reproducing on the food and in the food, but it also prevented bacteria from infiltrating the food, right? So if you created this huge salt case around a piece of meat, then nothing is going to get through that salt case and, and grow. So it was almost like a preventative and a barrier at the same time. What this does is it creates a hypertonic environment. So the cells, uh, the bacteria are not able to survive because um, they can't establish that equilibrium of water between the outside and inside environment. Finally, radiation. Here's where we talk about uh, that wave of light that is able to penetrate the cell and distort or destroy nucleic acids. It does this by breaking some of the bonds inside uh, the nucleic acid and it actually depends on the, um, the wavelength of light that you're using. There are different types of radiation, um, and some are more damaging than others. Uh, here we have this bacterial, cytal, ultraviolet light radiation as opposed to our visible light, right? And within that ultraviolet light section, this uh, UV light section, we're we have bacterial cytal um, is from 300 to 200. We have UV light, which is sort of our normal UV light, X-rays and gamma rays. And here you can see at the bottom, it's showing you the wavelength size. So as you decrease the wavelength size, uh, that's when you're getting out to that gamma ray um, side of the scale.
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on radiation, um, except to say that here the ionizing radiation is the shorter wavelength. This is gamma and cathode rays. These are the ones that are penetrating and breaking down the DNA. And we use this to sterilize medical supplies and food products. Here's a figure of how those bonds are being broken. Again, same sort of thing. And you can see here, um, this is an example of raspberries that are exposed to radiation and not exposed to radiation. So um, this is definitely keeping the structure and sort of function of the food without damaging the taste or the uh, nutritional you know, aspects of it, but preventing the bacteria or microbes from growing or mold. So you can see that looks more like mold than anything. Here's a little uh, link if you're interested in food irradiation in the United States.